If you will turn to Revelation chapter 2, we'll continue with our study of the seven churches of the book of Revelation, and in particularly the church to Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus? We know a few things from our study so far. What do we know about Ephesus? We have one more hand over here, Joe. Anyone else need a, a glossary? Please hang on to these as best you can. Please bring them every week as best you can. Ephesus, the city or the church? Oh, good question. <laughs> the city. The city. Wild and sinful. Wild and sinful. Does it remind you of any other church in the New Testament? Corinth. Yeah, Corinth. 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 Wild and sinful. Why in the world would God want a church in a wild and sinful place? That's exactly right. That's what the church is to do. And uh, if the truth be known, if we put our righteousness up against the Lord's righteousness in our lives... He probably called us out of a couple of wild situations, don't you think? Or a couple of sinful situations, don't you think? So, why should we not go and do likewise? And when we convert people and we bring them to the gospel, who are some of the best candidates? And most of the best candidates aren't the ones that we've already formulated in our minds. Well, he'd be a good one, he wouldn't, he'd be a good one, he wouldn't, like, you know petals on a flower, she loves me, she loves me not, kind of thing. Not all. Anybody else need one? Mm -hmm. All right. Is that the same one you can Yes. Yes, the same one. Yeah. Same one. Yes. Yeah, and you know, you talk about defending the gospel. Yes. I tell you, in the Atlanta area, the gospel is going out over the airway every week from several different congregations. That's right. That's right. That's a good thing. I heard a lesson this morning from the Temple Church of Christ. Great lesson. Yeah, I, and I've heard some from congregations I didn't even know existed. There's an airport. What is it? What's the airport area. airport area. That's the official name. Airport Area Church of Christ. Didn't even know such a congregation existed and found out that uh, the preacher of that congregation is a, is a, is a sound guy. It's all man. That's pretty cool. Like, like, it is. A, all that, and that's exactly, I, I guess, the idea uh, of that, that church. <laughs> but yes, there, there are lots of uh, ways that the gospel is being taken to this area, which uh, doesn't relieve us of our responsibility of doing uh, our part in that, but it is good to know that. And Ephesus was a wicked town. What what was I hear a comment or a question? What was the primary worship in Ephesus? And who was the worship E? Diana. 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 Sexual activity is called the worship. Yes. Oh, yes. Ephesus was a port city. We know those reputation of sailors, don't we, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, these sailors probably have a lady in every port, right? Is the idea? Well, this is what Ephesus was, truly. Uh, secular history tells us that. And uh, it was the fourth most important city in the Roman Empire. What were the first three? We know the first one in the Roman Empire. Rome, of course. Then Alexandria, right? Uh, in Egypt. And Antioch of Syria, where all of the Apostle Paul's missionary journey started. And then comes Ephesus. Well, we know a lot of background of the church in Ephesus. Uh, many of these churches we find their beginning in which New Testament book? Yeah. You know that book that we call Acts of Some of the Apostles, more accurately. Um, 
And we have an account of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And Paul tells of his experience there where he found 12 men who had been baptized with the baptism of John. Right? And they needed to be baptized again. They had not even heard about the Holy Spirit and the God who had given the Holy Spirit. And they were baptized in the name of Christ. And Paul began to teach in the synagogue of Ephesus. Why was he preaching in the synagogue in Ephesus? Because they were Seventh-day Adventists? That's what I'm being told here. Uh, a lot. No. That's where he went to convert people. He wasn't in fellowship with the Jews. He was trying to convert them. But many times he would call them what? We call them brothers. Why would he do that? Yeah, he was Jewish, number one. And number two, he was part of the human race. We're all brothers and sisters and children of Adam, aren't we? Yes. I was just going to say, how else are you going to convert them if they aren't your brother? You know what I mean? Like, you've got to go through them with that. Yes. There's a difference between being a brother in Christ and being a brother ethnically or being a, uh, an offspring of Adam, the Adamic race. So there are more than one sense in which we're brothers with people. And it's always wise to make that difference, especially in our own minds. But for three months, the Bible says, the reason from the Old Testament every Sabbath day that Jesus was the Messiah. And after three months, that's all the Jews could take, they drove him out of the synagogue, and he then entered greater opportunities, we might say, providentially speaking. And Paul went to the city, and he continued to dispute in the school of Tyrannus. Paul was a school teacher as well. And uh, according to the Codex Visa, it's one of the best manuscripts, really, that we have of the book of Acts, he taught the word of the Lord from 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. And the result of Paul's teaching was that the world was turned upside down and all of Asia heard the gospel. And so he establishes churches as he's moving about in Colossae, in Smyrna, in Thyatira, in Pergamum, in Philadelphia, in Sardis, in Laodicea, in different other cities of Asia Minor. Just not the seven that we read about in the book of Revelation. Throughout all of Western Asia. Paul engaged in exorcism. He met some Jewish exorcists, didn't he? But Paul's casting out of demons far surpassed what they could do. And people understood, they became really aware that Paul was a man of God, even though one whole book of the New Testament is dedicated to defending his apostleship, and that book being... And that book being... That's your cue. Second Corinthians. Good. Second Corinthians. So, as a result of Paul gaining in reputation here, people were burning their magical books. And so mightily, the Bible tells us, grew the word of God and prevailed. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20 in the context of Ephesus. Paul continued his preaching in this area of Ephesus, that God is not to be worshipped with things made with hands. Oh, brother. This offends everybody. This offends everybody. Why does it offend everybody? Why does it offend the Jews? Where do they worship? And where do they worship? In temples made with hands, right? 
Listen, the only reason they went to synagogues is because they couldn't get to the temple when they went into Babylonian captivity and they prepared another holy place where God could dwell and much of, quote, well, Christianity borrows that from Judaism when they think that we're in a place in an edifice like we're sitting is a temple, is a sanctuary, is a holy place. I'm grateful to God, whoever wrote uh, the song, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. That's much more biblical in nature than let's, you know, let's prepare this room with statues and idols and let's have, uh, let's, you know, let's have holy water that you have to douse yourself with before you can come into the holy place. And let's uh, mark off the uh, stage up here to where only the hierarchy can go. And on and on and on and on we go. But no, we don't worship in temples made with hands. We worship in temples made with minds. Because Christianity is a religion of the mind, of our spirit. And God is spirit. And they that worship him, let them worship him spirit. with physical things. Spirit. No, with their mind. Make sure your mind is engaged. That's what prepares you to be a sanctuary. And prepares you to be holy and separate and approachable in the mind of God. Because of Paul's preaching. Okay, and, and why, would, why would this idea that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, why would that offend, that's why it offended the Jews, why would it offend the Gentiles? That was where their living was made. Remember Jesus said that at least in this context, what it was the Jews, they had made the temple a den of what? Why? You know what I was told one time? That passage was used to show that Girl Scouts shouldn't be selling their cookies out in the foyer. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, and I was told that with a very straight face and with a very stern voice. Yeah. <laughs> Their livelihood was made in the temple of God and were introduced to a fellow named Demetrius in this context. And he was kind of offended, right? And his fellow silversmiths who were making images of Diana and as the word of God increased and grew in the minds of people, Money given for the purchase of Diana paraphernalia, Wayne. And so the worksmen of Ephesus would not appreciate that very much. And who was the cause of all that? The Apostle Paul. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Have you heard that? That's what the theme was in Ephesus. The whole city gets into an uproar. The town clerk called the free citizens of the city together into an, interestingly enough, an ecclesia. What's that word mean? Called out. Called out. What else does it mean? Community. Different communities. You can have ecclesias of the lot. But they were called into the community because of this riot. Do we not know that Diana of the Ephesians is great and that all Asia worships Diana of the Ephesians? Huh. If this gets up to the higher powers, it's going to be bad for all of us. Paul couldn't wait to get into the theater of Ephesus, and we're told that it sat over 25,000 people, but his good friends didn't want him to go. It reminds me how the apostles didn't want the Lord to go to Jerusalem, you know, toward the end of his ministry, because they knew what was awaiting. Same way with the apostle Paul. Paul was going to be baptized with the baptism that Jesus was baptized in, this baptism of suffering. Brother Matt, sir. In uh, Acts uh, twenty and thirty-one, yes, tells us that uh, Paul 
sketch here, it says, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn every one of you night and day with tears. So his, his ministry took him, uh, made him busy day and night. And he was engaged in warning every day and night with tears? Three years. Wow. Wonder how that was accepted. That much of it. Yes. I'm not trying to go too far off topic. I just I've never really paid attention to this verse before where it's talking about they who practice magic brought their books together and burned them. Yeah. And like in what like your, would that be like a like a magic book? Like yes. a, you know, yes. like, like, that's yes. that's what Paul was disputing big time. All I mean, of this. Truly, those people are passionate about that stuff. You know what I mean? For them to just totally do something that's pretty. That's right. And the Jew, and the Jew, you know, these are basically the Gentiles now. <laughs> right? Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles. The Jews knew better. It was, you know, the occult stuff, that was wrong under the law. And uh, when the truth was getting out now, and God is not dealing in temples made with hands, and he's not involved in all of the of the signs that people say that you can get messages you know the time that has been wasted with reading palms and reading cards and reading the stars and horoscopes and on and on and on and uh, you know Chinese fortune cookies when we go to dinner at the Chinese <laughs> restaurant all this stuff think of all the time that's been put into this and we just <laughs> God didn't think that, you know, that we need to really dabble into those things and to put any stock into those things. And these are the kinds of books that they were burning that, that talked about, you know, engaging in these kinds of things. Yeah. Yes? That's not unlike when a person gets converted today. When a person gets converted and they have a job like a bartender, <coughs> stuff like that, they recognize that they can't do that anymore. That's right. It's the same thing. And you know, there was there were probably some things that silversmiths could do. But the main part of their occupation, they didn't need to be doing. They were assisting. They were accomplices in the idea of idolatry. And uh, you know, it's interesting. We never read on a wide scale basis of the Jews engaging in idol idolatry after Babylonian captivity. And now it's starting to rear its head again in the church, not necessarily by the Jews, but by the Gentiles now. <clears throat> so where are the Jews you know, in all of this? Why is Paul dealing this mainly by himself and with his you know, compatriots? Where, where are the Jews in all of this? This is why they went into captivity. It was because of all this. Well, in Acts 20, then, as Jack was uh, alluding to, Paul calls together the elders of the church in Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. And he could not go, secular history tells us, to uh, Ephesus at this time because the Caesar River had risen and overflowed its banks, which it does uh, periodically. And he told them that I have not shunned, I have not kept back any part of the truth. And he tells them that they eat unto themselves and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made them overseers to feed the church of God which Jesus purchased with his own. Church important? Just take the one of your choice. I'm going to make a comment later. I don't want to make it now. But it, it has to do with this very idea. It's amazing to me. In a verse like this, a section of scripture. Uh, Paul says, I know this. When an inspired apostle says he knows this, you can mark it down, take it to the bank. When an apostle spoke by inspiration, it was just as if Jesus were speaking himself. 
He says, I know this. That after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The book of Ephesians has six chapters that sets apart the magnificence and the grandeur of the church of the living God. Besides the biblical letter to the Ephesians, we also have the letter of Ignatius of Antioch to the church of God in Ephesus, written about 117. As he was on his way to Rome to meet his death by lions, these two letters shed more light on the situation of the church in Ephesus as addressed in Revelation. And when you read the section of scripture that we're studying now, the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, a lot of what Ignatius wrote was in that context. Interesting comparison. All right, as we discussed two weeks ago, the Lord's revelation. Notice how we refer to that, the Lord's revelation begins. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. Right, why was it being written? Why didn't Paul say, listen, Hey, the Lord laid something heavy on my heart last night, and I'm going to, or, or, or John, why, why did he not just, you know, communicate this verbally? Why was he told to write it down? It was like a, right. it was like a, like a will. He was write, writing, writing the will, and once it was confirmed, it didn't have to be confirmed anymore. That is such a good thought. Did you hear what Jack said? It was like writing a will. And I might add one thing to that. It was exactly like writing a will. Amen. It's in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. That's the New Testament. That's his last will and testament. And that's why at the end of that will, in the middle of that will, and at the beginning of that will, it says don't add to it or take from it to that will. And that's what we do with our wills, don't we? When we write it, don't add to it and don't take from it. And that's why we make a bunch of copies of it. Because it'd be harder to change it that way. And it'd be harder for people not to ascertain what the testator wanted. Write it down. Write it in a book. We don't know the identity of this angel. Could have been Polycarp, could have been Timothy, could have been, who knows. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, right, to set things in order, maybe. These things said he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the middle of the seven golden, uh, uh, golden candlesticks. What's happening here? He who held the seven stars in his right hand was none other than who? Christ. The last verse of the first chapter tells us the seven stars are the? Angels. Yes, messengers, angels, angelos of the seven churches. And the Lord had promised, right? I will be with you. How long? Always. Even into the end of the age. So our Lord held in the hollow of his hand the angel of the church. It is. The candlestick that the Lord walked among were the churches who held the candle, who held the light. We are the light of the world. Remember, there's a difference between the light and the candlestick. Paul told the, uh, the Philippians, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the Son, small s, of God, without rebuke, in the midst of 
a crooked and perverse nation, here it is, whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, there were some things that the Christians in Ephesus were doing that would be dimming their light. They were doing some good things. They were doing some not so good things. And we'll look at those. And as we look at those, do we just attribute those to Ephesus? No. We're dealing here with an overall view of the church of all time. And that's why I believe there were seven churches here. The complete, right? Seven is complete. In the book of Revelation, the complete church. There are characteristics of these that the Holy Spirit wanted documented and studied in the church of Christ since its inception on the day of Pentecost. And many of the grievous wolves that enter in among the church, in this idea the church is, the congregations, are entering in because of some of these problems here. And so that's why we want to look at these and why this is such an important study. Well, the Lord continues to write to Ephesus in verses 2 and 3. I know your works. Why in the world? Is that phrase used to every congregation of these seven churches? I know your works. And I know your labor. And to Ephesus, he says, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil. That's a good thing. That's a compliment. The Lord's church should not bear evil. You have to be patient with it, yes, but you don't bear it in the sense that you acquiesce, that you like it, you see. This was good about Ephesus. You have those that try them which say they are apostles and are not. False apostles. There were plenty of them. And we have some of their works even in print today. In what we call the pseudepigrapha, spurious writings. You have found them to be false, you've found them to be liars, and you've not fainted in all of this. The Lord knew the works of the Ephesian Christians. All things were laid open before the eyes of him with whom they and we have to do. He knew their long suffering. Patience. That's one of the rungs on the ladder of the Christian graces, right? Second Peter chapter 1. Isn't patience one of those? Long suffering. Repeatedly, the New Testament urges Christians to be patient. To be long suffering. Is that not one of the major themes of the book of Revelation? The question is, Lord, how long? What was the answer, generally speaking? Be patient. Be patient. I think that's a major me message to the church today, to individual Christians today. And why do so many fall away? They're not patient. They're not patient. The Ephesian Christians had also tried out a bunch of in, uh, itinerant preachers who had claimed to be gospel preachers that were going around, went up and down the Roman world, claiming to have the gladsome news of the gospel, but in reality, they didn't have it. You know, you would think in religion today there's not even such a thing as a false teacher. And many so-called, those that claim to be Christians, wouldn't know a false teacher if he bit them. You can decide where the Bible would take them. <laughs> the Lord highly commended the church in Ephesus, though. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought they had some problems. Oh, yeah, they had some problems. I suppose... 
every church I've ever been in had a problem. And one of those problems was named Matt Amos. You know, if there ever was a perfect church where I got there, it's perfect any longer, I promise. You know, there are going to be churches that have problems. You know that, right? Few congregations, though, of the Lord's Church would have higher commendations than the church in Ephesus, even with some of their problems. The Lord said, though, and here's the key word, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Aren't you glad that we can take our nevertheless things that are against us if we're walking in the light? Then we can have the blood take care of those. That's why. That's why it's grand to be a Christian. But here it is, the church at Ephesus, they, they really have messed it up in this area. And they got to get it back. And this is a, a, an all-encompassing issue, too. This is not just an isolated, uh, specific incident. You know, it's a sad thing when a couple marries in their youth, and then they leave their first love. And it's even worse when a Christian, when someone is baptized into Christ and decides, I'm going to marry Christ and I'm never going to leave him, you know, like a wedding ceremony. And they leave their first love. You know, a lot of people try to take this and they try to be very specific with it. I think that's a mistake. Because love involves a lot of things. And love is very much in our world today, misunderstood, misapplied, and a lot of times a farce is made out of love. Love to most people is something that I like, something that excites me, something that I prefer. And we love a lot of things, don't we, in our world. You love shopping? I don't. Hate it. Hate it with a passion. Hate shopping. But in attempting and to do the best to love my wife, guess what I have to do once in a while? I go shopping. I go shopping. Now, I don't want to leave my first love, so I go shopping. Don't want her to leave me, so I go shopping. But it's not always because I feel good about shopping that I do that. It's not because I feel good about doing everything the Lord wants me to do that I suck it up and do it anyway. Love puts the interest of the one being loved above his own interests. That helps in every marriage. But Ephesus wasn't doing that. They were leaving that initial love. You, you remember what kind of love and zeal you had when you were first baptized? And how you were ready to take on the world for Christ? And now we don't do that anymore? To the degree that we don't do that anymore, we have left our first love. Why aren't we as in love with Christ as we were when we first married? What happened? This was the, this was the case at Ephesus. Okay. So I see a hand. Okay, John, go ahead. I have a question here. Based on the fact um, what they were doing right and doing, it wasn't like they, they quit doing that. It's not like this letter is telling them that they're, they quit doing that and forsaking their first law. They are doing those things that are listed there properly, but yet they're still being blamed for forsaking their first law. Aren't we talking about a degree here on, on what we're fulfilling? Yes. And I don't see any evidence here of this, of, of this being that they're out in the world bringing people to Christ. They're defending the word, they're defending what they're teaching, but they're not, in other words, they're at 
activity on the outward form as Christ is lacking. Yes. And, yes. That, and to be honest, from my life experience, that is one of the biggest problems in the church, no matter where you go, is people, most of us want to come in here and we want to serve what we think is going to make us feel comfortable as in Christ. Uh -huh. And I, I, we fall into that, not really putting that effort into that area that we need to. And I think that's what he's aiming here. And I think that's why it's the first letter, because it's the most common problem. Very good. Yes. And we'll talk more about those things next time. Yes. This passage reminds me of a cliche that says people are so much involved in church work that they don't do the work of the church. And that can happen. That can happen. And, th and we need to make sure when we, when we broadcast to people how busy we are here, let's make sure what the nature of that busyness is. You know, the children of Israel were busy when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't know how much they got accomplished. Brother Matt, the uh, good things that he commended them for? Yes. When he says, nevertheless, could it be they were still doing those things, but it were not motivated by love. Yes, that's exactly right. They had, and, and that's having a form of godliness, but yes, that's exactly right. Good, good. I heard a bell. Was that one or two? Second. Okay. Well, I was just going to say there's a sign of mine, too, because one of the best examples that I have of seeing a church that I know a congregation, I guess I should say better than that, it really lose a lot of strength because nobody was really willing to do stuff. You know, everybody kind of just was kind of hands off and didn't volunteer to do the work that needed to be done. And it, it started to seriously, not really crumble, that's not a good way to say it, but it's nowhere near as strong as it used to be. And I mean, that's the church I grew up going to. I mean, it, they, they had a hard time finding people to volunteer to do anything. Like, you can tell, because I mean, they used to be like a, a really strong force of the game. You know? Sounds like they left their first love. That's right. Next hour, we're going to be talking about some of this. I guess one of the things that motivated the lesson next hour uh, were some things that, um, that I witnessed while Chris and I were out of town uh, for the last few days. And also this very idea that John and uh, Jimmy talk about here. I'll say it. I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Because I heard the second bell.